everybody. My name is RJ Taylor. I'm a second generation trout farmer from Ontario, Canada. I'm very excited um, to be part of the World Trout Summit and be invited to chat about the Ontario Rainbow Trout Sector. We've been farming trout in Ontario since the 1950s um, and have a pretty tight community and a long history here and I look forward to giving you an update on where things are at today. So about me, second generation fish farmer. So uh, me and my sister um, and a whole big crazy team, we raise trout, salmon, and Arctic char at um, several farms in Ontario, several land-based farms, um, as well as a net pen site, and we do some processing and some home delivery. You may know us as Spring Hills Fish, um, which is sort of our, our brand, I'd say, or Cedar Crest Trout Farms. Uh, in addition to that, I'm also the managing director for the Ontario Aquaculture Association, we can get into that at the end, but we're a sort of an industry-led organization, 45 plus members, just trying to um, raise the profile and, and uh, increase and grow um, production of rainbow trout here in Ontario. Prior to joining the family farm about six years ago, I was also worked in science education and communication, places like a theoretical physics institute, Dyson, University of Toronto Engineering. And I decided to, to make the jump back to the family business. Uh, I'm also just really passionate about growing food for people, um, especially with sort of an environmental and sustainability bend. Um, I'm the uh, vice chair for the Livestock Research Innovation Corporation and involved in lots of other organizations and committees and things pushing that forward. So in Ontario, um, the primary species that we do raise is rainbow trout. Like I said, we're going on 60, 70 years here. Um, it makes up over 90% of our sector, uh, and that's mostly because it's really genetically hardy. It was actually naturalized here um, 140 years ago, uh, and we started domesticating it in the 1950s. So Ontario sees some pretty hot temperatures uh, in the summer and some very cold temperatures and ice in the winter. And so over the last sort of 25 to 30 generations of trout, we've been able to um, continue developing the ability for that trout to thrive here in Ontario. Um, but trout isn't our, isn't our only game. We also have sort of different sort of smaller operations, including ours, um, growing things like Arctic char, coho salmon, some pilot projects for Lake Whitefish, and some of the others you see on the list there. Our industry today, it's a little bit hard to, to, to peg, um, but we say there's about like 35 active commercial farms of various sizes. The line blurs a little bit between some of the restocking community hatcheries versus the sort of commercial uh, human consumption side, but this really focuses on, on what's being raised for people to eat. Uh, we employ over 500 people, produce about 12, uh, sorry, 15 million pounds a year. We like to say that's about 100 million servings or 100 million meals of, of rainbow trout, and our farm gates around um, 40 million. All sorts of different farms here in Ontario. We have the flow through, which are typically hatcheries. We have um, a very vibrant net pen scene. We have some, um, we're circulating sites to, to different levels of success and some community level aquaponics projects. This is a bit of a map of where we're raising rainbow trout in Ontario. So for those that aren't necessarily familiar with where we are, um, we're right dead center in the middle of the country. So we're pretty much as far away from the oceans um, as one can get in Canada. A lot, where you see a lot of those red dots on the map is where the majority of Ontarians live. Um, and if we go one step further, you'll see sort of how our, our farms break down. So in sort of some of the most populated sort of southern areas of the, the province, um, it's where you see a lot of the flow through farms, you see a lot of the hatcheries. Um, further south, you even see some of the main processors. Um, and then we do a lot of our grow out um, in Northern Ontario. So for context, if you're driving from the middle of that green section all the way up to maybe to one island, um, it can probably take you close to 10 hours. So this is, um, makes us all seem, you know, like next door neighbors, but we're, we're, we're anything but. So really um, to produce an Ontario rainbow trout for um, the market, it's being born in the South, heading North and then coming back South for the process. So. Now is probably a good time to, to chat about sort of the future of the sector. We continue to find new spots and, and make existing farms more efficient and expand while also finding new sites um, in these areas that you see here, but also there's some opportunities to go even further north um, along the, the North Shore Lake Superior as well um, that's being explored. So where does Ontario Rainbow Trout go? 
Honestly, it goes all over. Um, we are really spoiled in the fact that there's a huge demand for Ontario rainbow trout um, right here in Ontario, um, largely through the retail services, but it is also heading um, to other provinces in Canada, places like Quebec, um, or even the East Coast, and then being exported into the States. We have a really long history um, in Ontario of the trout farmers here working together, um, and that included a sort of co-op in the early days, where even though they were sort of small farms to compete and sort of fill those larger retail contracts, they all sort of pooled their supply into a main processor and sold out from there. Um, over the last 30, 40 years, that's really helped develop trout into a premium product here. So in various places across, say, the United States, trout might be smaller hand sized, um, but here, and it might not even be sort of pigmented, um, but here in Ontario, we're growing fish to three, four, five pounds, um, which is giving you those sort of 12 ounce, 14 ounce plus fillets, um, deep, deep orange, like you see in the photo. Um, and that's sort of largely being consumed in Ontario, but also we do, we do export as well. And largely, um, mostly, I would say, through, through retail. Uh, here's just a look at the north, a bit of a zoomed in. So for contacts, it probably takes about six hours to drive around this island. These are not close places, but these are some of our net pen farms. So in the, the, the it was really sort of the mid 90s, but it continued to grow with time. Um, we saw a lot of opportunity for um, net pen aquaculture in the freshwaters of Georgia Bay, Lake Huron. Typically, um, very cold. Um, we, we have seen, although we, we've sort of risen to some of the unique challenges that exist that I'll get into, we have seen lots of success with, with these scales um, of farm. And this is sort of, these farms are ranging anywhere from one to two to maybe three million um, per site in terms of farm weight pounds. So. So just to look at what an Ontario hatchery looks like, um, typically it's a flow through or sort of what we call a partial recirculating. So we are sort of building on a lot of these farms that have existed for decades, but implementing new sort of recirculating type technologies. But you see a lot of um, sort of classic flow through. This is where a, a trout would spend the first six to nine, maybe even 12 months um, here in the hatchery raising anywhere between to 50 to 100 grams, and then they're sent north to the net fence. Um, just another look, you can see one of our, our breeders there in the bottom right. Um, a little bit about our, our breeding. So in Ontario, um, we're, we're fortunate that we have um, lots of genetic diversity. Still, we've done, we've done several tests. There are several farms um, with breeding programs, including, including ours. The great thing about the breeding programs that or the, the fish that we've been breeding here in Ontario is that it has been the, the, the breeders themselves for generations have been subjected to those really hot summers. We're talking waters of 20, 22, sometimes even up to 24, 25 C. Um, and then they also managed to live through some of those very, very cold winters. So we, um, we typically breed um, like a mixed sex diploid here in Ontario it tends to be the sort of most grown fish. Um, though we will work with other sort of international suppliers for like all feminized or triploid stocks. Um, but we do find a lot of success with the genetics that we have here in Ontario. Um, net pen farms. So we have a few sort of different styles of these here in Ontario. What you see here is a, a cage array where we have these sort of large hexagonal ones. Um, the for those who, who, who haven't necessarily been to uh, a place like Georgia Bay or Lake Huron, um, I've seen many faces with awe when they come out to the shore and they realize that you can be in a place with fresh water and you can't even see the shores on the other side. It has a very ocean, maritime, marine feel to it, though it is fresh water. Um, and so we have the, the net pens here. One of the interesting things um, that we deal with here with our net pens I always like to show that picture on the top right is lots and lots of ice. So um, our farms, depending on sort of where they are, they um, are actually submersible um, or movable because in the, when the ice starts to come in in the fall, which we call ice in, or it starts to go out in the spring, which we call ice out, those big 
pieces of ice, sometimes like a kilometer long, and then moving and coming back or sort of through the channel. And they can be quite devastating to a, to a net pen site. On one hand, we like them. They really um, uh, help with sort of biosecurity and pathogen control for sure, some of those cold, cold, cold waters. Um, but it does mean that we often find a lot of the net pen technology that we see in operation elsewhere doesn't necessarily work here. So, um, yeah, here's just an idea of what we call life in the north. So on the bottom right, that's actually our, our team. Very excited because they finished their harvesting for the year. It's, it's um, January and they finally get to head home for a couple months before we, we start farming in the spring. Um, so depending on where these net pen sites are, we're also um, have different sort of growing seasons, but we are harvesting rainbow trout out of um, net pen sites um, 12 months of the year, keeping a steady supply to, to those customers. So we also have some free state of the art processing. So Pound for pound, um, if you're sort of comparing us with salmon, we might not get the same poundage, but we're not doing these really big fish. We're targeting sort of a three pound, four pound fish. So our piece count is incredibly high. And I know um, our friends at Coleman Road Foods are very proud of a very streamlined uh, processing facility that they have in St. Thomas, Ontario. And you can see some of those dips right there. Uh, I do like to mention that there are some trout, um, not in this picture, that are grown in aquaponics facilities. Um, that's more of sort of the community level type operation. Um, and one thing, I, another thing I also really wanted to, to mention too was here in Ontario, we actually have really, really strong um, indigenous participation in the sector. So of all those net pen operations that you saw, um, the vast majority of them are actually operated through a partnership with a local First Nation. Either the First Nation issues the license, it has a joint equity, um, supplies uh, lots of the workforce there, um, and, and, and really when we talk about Ontario's aquaculture sector, Ontario's river trout sector continuing to grow, um, we often talk about the strong participation of, of Indigenous communities. And I, and I should mention the last time I talked to one of our local economic development groups, Wabitech, which works with First Nations communities. Um, there was over three dozen um, agriculture projects um, that are sort of community run through First Nations that are past the feasibility and into the actual um, setup and, and build stage. So we're very excited to see where, where that's going to take our sector. So uh, another part of the Ontario trout sector and part of our, our secret sauce and our success over the last few decades has been the Ontario Agriculture Research Centre. Many of us call it ELMA. Uh, and this is just a really incredible world-class research center um, located in Southern Ontario. They have um, their own breeding stock and an immense amount of, of skill in their workforce and then also capability to run different projects on genetics, on things like feed, feed ingredients, um, looking at how different groups uh, succeed, um, and then also they've been part of sort of a, another major aspect of um, Ontario, which has been our new vaccination program. So uh, in different areas of the world, um, Lactococcus has presented itself. And for us here in Ontario, it was sort of the first sort of major disease, really the only major disease issue um, that, we've, that, that we face. It really kind of reared its, its head in the Ontario trout sector sort of three years ago, might have been here for a few years before that, um, and had some sort of significant impacts um, on, on fish health and mortalities. Um, but in the true spirit of Ontario trout producers and how much we work together and, and um, uh, even just farm to farm, producer to producer, staff person to staff person, we really came together really quickly. We brought in our own vaccination program for an autogenous vaccine that you see here in the photo. And now the vast majority of trout entering um, from the fingerling stage to the growth stage is, is vaccinated. Um, and here's one of those machines. So we're actually using a dip vaccine and then also one that, um, that's injected into their, into their gut. So lots of lessons there. For the last two years that we've been doing this, we've really seen um, some amazing results. Um, 
And uh, I'd like to think after sort of falling off the rails as a, as a sector for a short little bit there, we were back and better than ever. Um, another aspect of Ontario's trout sector is the immense amount of science and research that has gone into the environmental and sustainability side of things. So we like to, to say that we have enough scientific knowledge after several decades of work to say that our net pen sites are actually good for the environment. You could probably even use the word regenerative um, if you really wanted to get all marketing and buzzworthy. Um, it's really the foundation for that is on a study that was done in what we call the experimental lakes area. And the cold notes on, on that one are that we actually had a net pen site in a sort of untouched lake that had a very similar profile in terms of nutrients and sort of biodiversity than the wider Georgian Bay and Lake Huron where all of our other net pen sites are located. Um, and our, our federal government uh, researchers, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, along with lots and lots of collaborators, put in a net pen site um, after seven years, I think, of pre-work put in an FN site, operated for five years, took it away, and then did another like seven years or so of work. And they found that that NAPTEN site actually had a direct link to increasing the population of wild lake trout. Um, and that was because in this particular lake, which is the same as Georgia Bay and Lake Huron, there is significant deficiency in nutrients because of invasive zebra mussels and quagga mussels. Um, and sort of other human impact issues. And so introducing a net pen site actually is part of the solution for kickstarting that food web, giving all the critters at the bottom food so that they can continue, um, you know, being food for the things next on the level and next, next, next. And so we saw through this research that the lake, the lake trout, which were waiting until the very last year to spawn or spawning years earlier, therefore, increasing the, the populations and then we also um when we took the farm away those populations went back to normal you can see on the graph there from the yellow to the green to the yellow which really shows that that farm was part of the sort of solution for increasing the, the wild fish and unfortunately um it's a sad story necessarily the the, the, the case of something like georgia bay and lake huron with this invasive species, um, but it's really um, amazing to see fish farms be part of that solution. So, and we talk a lot in Ontario um, and in the trout sector that because we're small and we're really pale in comparison to say some of the large marine sites um, in Canada or around the world, that people bring those concerns to us and they aren't necessarily um, our issues. Um, the amount of people that have told me that, you know, sea lice is such a big issue with your trout. Like, well, I don't really understand because sea lice don't really live in salt water. Um, sorry, sea lice don't live in fresh water um, because they don't exist here. So there's lots of things we like to say, like if people say phosphorus is the enemy. Well, actually, these farms in Ontario are part of a, a really cool environmental story. Um, and then there's this thing of farm fish escaping and out competing wild fish. Well, it's really funny because here in Ontario, um, there is trout stocked through the government hatcheries and through the community hatchery programs that is the sort of same genetic stock. Um, and sometimes I get that refuted a little bit, but you know, we're we're selling these trout to community hatcheries that get that get released. So it's a it's a funny story. Also, we're really fortunate we don't have any of those sort of major federally reportable diseases or sea lice. The Alaska caucus is sort of fairly new for us. And we don't really operate with much opposition, um, especially with First Nations. We're really embraced here in Ontario. Um, I think partly we've just been around long enough and people you know, don't aren't seeing the sort of effects that they would have thought maybe decades ago. Um, and we really, we operate as members of our communities and in these, in these partnerships as First Nations. That's, that's also very, that's for community participation is, is really, really evident. So, uh, Ontario sector, we're very focused on best agricultural practices. That I think all, if not the vast majority of our sites are certified, um, all the way from the feed mills that supply us, to hatcheries, to the farms, and up to the um, processors as well. 
that was a big decision of the Ontario sector five years ago, um, to, because we really liked that it um, it talked to the social responsibility as much as the environmental responsibility. So, uh, and then also a couple of years ago, we were also recognized by Ocean Ones, uh, which was really important to us as another sort of notch on our belt for for our sustainability and that includes our, our our flow through and our our network operations. So, one of the things that they noted for the Ocean Wise audit. Um, is that we have a very, very low use of antibiotics, which is something that we're, we're very, very proud of too. So, um, if you'll excuse me for a little Canadian moment, I'm going to have my Tim's. So, some of the more advocacy pieces. Um, if we, as a sector, we're having trouble meeting demand here in Ontario, that's a fact. We're growing, but we're still not meeting market share. Um, we're good for the environment, and we have so much fresh water. I mean, you saw that map. Then why aren't we growing more? That's for a few reasons. First one is, of course, that public perception of agriculture. So people seem to hear these negative stories elsewhere, and then they assume that's what's happening here in Ontario. I don't really want to get into refuting that that stuff probably isn't happening in places they're concerned about either, but I can certainly say it's not happening. Um, we don't always have the most political sort of more bureaucratic support for the sector. Uh, it waxes and wanes for sure. Um, but it really sort of rears its head when it comes to us trying to renew permits, um, or licenses, or we're trying to get sort of new water quality guidelines. Um, once we sort of, although we might be embraced politically, and I think we're sort of recognized for having lots of political support at this current moment, when it sort of gets down into those decision makers. They can really just throw a wrench in, um, and that that really uh, lags our sector. We we got twenty year licenses for the net fund farms in twenty nineteen, um, and still it's twenty twenty three, soon to be twenty twenty four, and we're still operating on one year one year renewable licenses. So we haven't been able to figure out exactly um, how to how to work through those. There's lots of different roadblocks along the way. Um, also in Ontario, uh, we do have high capital startup like many fish farms. I'm sure, we're self-financed, we're self-insured, um, and we really have to beg, borrow, and steal on our own dime uh, to grow. Um, I also just want to underscore the opportunity for Ontario trout here. We do have lots and lots and lots and lots of water. Uh, we do continue to have soaring market demand. We have this incredibly populated place um, here in Ontario, probably 15 or maybe plus along the sort of the main corridor. The very engaged Indigenous groups. Uh, climate change is opening up new growth area and still gives us challenges elsewhere. Uh, and then we all know agriculture is steady year round, well paying jobs. So, also, there's a big food security element that really gets me excited, especially in this northern. So that's really about all I had to say about the Ontario trout sector today. Um, I did just want to plug very quickly. We have our Ontario Aquaculture Association. Ever since the days of my father in the sector, um, we've always had a really close community of growers. I often, you know, at least this is the case um, that I see other places. Sometimes there's not really a concentration of trout farmers and often there's sort of the lone wolves here or there. Um, all of you, you folks, you all have a home here in our, in our sector um, because we have an amazing conference, usually um, the end of March every year. Um, we had almost every province um, of, of, of Ontario, uh, sorry, of Canada, and several um, different U.S. states represented at the last one because there are trout farms all over. Um, and, and by coming together, there's a lot of knowledge sharing because perhaps you figured something out that we haven't, um, or maybe we figured something out, and, and our farms are very open um, and very willing to share all of the things that, that we learn. So um, please, if you just go to like Ontario seafoodfarmers.ca um, or send me an email, I'd love to send you information on that on that conference. It's a really pretty way. And if you're here, um, I'm pretty sure all the gates are open for all of the farms to come and see things for yourself. So um, the OAA is really the, the beating heart of that. Um, we are created entirely funded by industry, um, largely focused on speaking as one voice to the government, doing a lot of um, community building and public education. We represent some 95% of the, the sector. It doesn't stop with farmers, 
It's also the feed companies, the technology suppliers, the other sorts of suppliers, the consultants and the other NGOs and the indigenous groups would all sort of come together in the spirit of growing the drug sector here in Ontario. Uh, and there's sort of a list of our members and our board of directors as well. I uh, just want to recognize all those people um, as some of the folks working together to get more Ontario trout onto seafood shelves. Uh, and so that's it for me. Um, I look forward to seeing you at the Trout Summit. Please take down my email. Please take down this website. Um, and I'd love to, to, to connect as well. You can also find me on in our, our company online as uh, Spring Hills Fish on Instagram, Facebook, and all those places. So thank you very much. Any follow-up questions, please feel free to send them to me, and I'll get, I'll get to them. So thank you very much, and have a really great day, and enjoy the summit.